Welcome to our review from the Tales from the Loop board game from Free League oh, Publishing. What did they do there? Who we have to thank for sending us a review copy. All right, Tales from the Loop, the board game, was designed by Rickard and Troya and Martin Takichi and features artwork from Rain Rosenberg and, of course, Steinman Stallenhog who is responsible for creating the entire Tales from the Loop thing through his fantastic art books. Now, this cooperative board game plays one to five players with games taking anywhere from an hour and a half to three to four hours, depending on the player count and which scenario you choose to play. Now, this very full and heavy box has an MSRP of $56.99 US. One note, we are reviewing the retail version of this game, not the Kickstarter version that came with additional miniatures and scenarios. All right, so in Tales from the Loop, you are playing kids in an 80s that never was, in an area of Sweden where they built the Loop, a large hadron collider, and weird stuff is happening. You're going to pick a scenario to play and then solve the mystery of that scenario, using mechanics that will be familiar from anyone who's a fan of the Tales from the World role-playing game, also from Free League Publishing. Now, for a uh, look, check out our unboxing video on YouTube. Yeah, you get to check out the components of the game, which I've got to say are pretty much top-notch. I, I have zero complaints about the components in this game whatsoever. You got some really cool-looking miniatures. You got standees for the, the characters, which works. You've got a really... Um, vibrant clear looking board so i will admit the the grid on it is a little too light so so one little minor flaw with the board the grid's a little too light you have a ridiculous number of cards a bunch of tokens you've got a set of tales from the loop dice these are custom d6 dice where the six has the symbol of reeks energy the company that owns the loop on them these are the exact same dice that are used for the role-playing game. So bonus, if you play the role-playing game, you get a bonus set of dice in this. Or if you already own the role-playing game, you have extra dice you can use with the board game. Um, you got dual-layer boards. That's another highlight there. You got some really nice mechanics for slotting in stuff onto these boards based on the player count. You got cards for the robot, just lots of nice stuff. Everything excellent quality. It all punched great. And it even comes with a box insert. Though I will say there's nothing that tells you what goes where. So I have no idea if my board game is organized properly, but it all fits back in the box and it's kept safe. So I'm happy with it. And we mentioned in the synopsis that this is a heavy game. There's a reason because you really do get a ton of quality material yeah. that makes this a, a solid hunk of a yes. board game box. <sighs> and then, yeah, no, I, the, the double, the double layer uh, boards are really, uh, a phenomenal aspect of this game I, it would mm -hmm. not be the same if you had to worry about knocking cubes for instance especially yes. uh there, there's a lot of little places to to track things on your player boards mm -hmm. and i would hate to try and do that without a double layer board <laughs> totally agree so what exactly are we doing with all these fantastic components all right, so you're gonna you're gonna set everything up. You know, put the board out, pull out all the player boards, all that stuff. Get everything kind of out on the table. You're going to pick a scenario to play. There are multiple scenarios included with the game, all of which are replayable. Um, I would go so far as say infinitely replayable. Though I will admit, knowing what's coming will change the way you play. So there is definitely an experience to be had playing a scenario the first time, and a different experience had playing it a second time. What I strongly recommend, and I'm going to say this here instead of later in the review, is play one of the one-week scenarios, and I specifically recommend The Passenger or The Light Fantastic as they introduce you better to the game than the other scenarios. You know, the rule book will tell you to play Bot Amok. I strongly don't recommend playing that one. That's actually the most complicated scenario in the entire game. I'm not sure why they recommend it. So you're going to pick a scenario. You're going to take all the cards for that scenario. You're going to use the reference card to kind of get things set up, which involves shuffling some decks and stuff like that. I'm not going to get into the full details here. Then everyone's going to pick a kid to play. So again, you are playing kids, and these are kids from the 80s who, of course, had a lot more freedom than most of the kids nowadays have. Uh, these are the type of kids you expect uh, that you see in movies like E.T. or in the TV show Stranger Things. And though I haven't seen it, I have to assume the Amazon Tales from the Loop series. Um, you've got a bunch of kids with a little less restrictions that you're playing you're each going to pick one each kid is is identical except for three things you're going to have a specific stat out of six that you're good at 
a specific stat out of six you're terrible at, and you're going to have a unique item. This is an item you can use infinite number of times you'll never lose. Other than that, the kids are pretty much the same except for like description and what they look like. Once you've all picked your kids, you're then going to get it set up for based on the number of play. So your skill levels change based on how many players you're playing. Then you're going to start on the school. Now you're going to start the game. You're going to start off getting a chore. So there's a deck of chores. You're going to shuffle this. Everyone's going to get two and they're going to pick one to use. Now, this is an awesome part of the game where there is stuff you have to get done by Friday in the first week. And if you have a second week of play, you're actually going to draw a new chore and have to be done by Thursday. But you have to complete this or else you get penalized. And they include all kinds of things. Like uh, you have to go to hockey practice. You got to mow the lawn. You got to clean your room. You have to return your movies to the video store before they're, they're late and so on. Now you're going to take these chores and then you're going to start your day at school. Now you start a day at school by drawing a school card. Something's going to happen and someone's going to have to roll some dice. This might be the player whose turn it is. So they're, they're gonna, it's going to uh, only be them. Or it could be the entire group has to roll or one player can roll and the other players are going to help. Now I'm going to explain the roll system really simple. You're going to look at the skill. You're going to look at your number of the skill. You're going to roll that many of the D6 dice. And if you get any six, you succeed. If you fail, you have the option to push. And you do that by taking one of three complication types. Again, a little more detail than you need for this type of review. You take a complication and you can reroll. Again, you're just looking for one six. If you succeed, you get whatever it says good happens. And if you fail, you get whatever penalty. If any other players help, they also are subject to the penalty. And some cards have a different penalty for the helpers than the person making the roll. Uh, there are actually some cards, too, that don't take place right then. They could affect the day. Yes. Yeah, that is definitely. And some don't actually require a roll. Some just say this is happening. Like the buses aren't running today, which can be really annoying. <laughs> then you start playing. And the interesting thing is at this point, you don't even know what you need to do. None of the scenarios tell you from right at the start what the mystery is or what you need to do to win or what happens to make you lose. You literally have no idea when you play. And this is why that gameplay, the first time you play a scenario is going to be very different from the second time you play a scenario. Now, what you will have is something going on on the board and then a key on a card that tells you what to do. So it might be if you go investigate the robot, flip this card over. Or it might be as soon as you've gotten to insight, flip, draw this card and put it in play. And these are all different besides all the scenario. Now, most of these events are based on two um resources i don't know what you call those what would you call the two things at the top um i Actors. guess yeah track this basically it, it's the two game stats like they're the yeah. stats for the actual game the good and the bad yeah so you're, you're good your good is insight insight into the mystery right you're figuring things out you gain insight by um like solving problems enigma is the bad thing and that happens when you fail at rolls or when certain events happen like the school gets lit on fire Slight spoiler, but I'm not telling you where it happened, so it's not going to really give you anything away. Um, so then you can just play. Like, you wander around the board and you start doing stuff. Now, one of the things that's going to happen is you're going to fill the board with rumors. Start of the game, there are four rumors on the board, and there's a bunch of locations on the board, all uh, signed by letters. And there are points on these Swedish islands connected by, by – it's a path map, right? Some of the restrict or areas are restricted and some are open, which will matter when you're moving. You're going to put out rumors, and one of the main things you're probably going to do at the start of the game is just have to start investigating the local rumors to try to get your insight up. Now, some of the rumors are going to be generic that are in every game. that are It's all part of a deck, and some will be specific to the scenario. The basic rules for insight and enigma are if you solve a rumor effectively that's for the plot, you gain an insight. If you fail any rumor, you gain an enigma. And if rumors are left up too long, if they get pushed off the end of the board, you gain two Enigma, which is actually terrible. Now, there's a whole system for replenishing them, but I'm not going to get into the details of that, but I will say it's based on the player count. So now you're kind of moving around the board and you're going to do the things. And the way you do this is you have six cubes that represent your time. So basically, you went to school in the morning, you've got six hours, we'll say, abstractly. You've got six hours at the end of the school day to do stuff. You spend cubes to do things like walking. It takes one cube to move to an adjacent spot on the map or two if you go to a restricted area. You can take a bus. There's a line of locations on the map that are connected by a bus. It takes you one cube to move to any of those. You can call your parents for a ride. They will bring you to any open spot on the map, but not the restricted areas. 
Don't know, they will pick you up from the restricted areas to bring you somewhere else. That costs a cube, but can only be done if your parents are happy with you. Because at the top of your character card are, is a spot where you represent if your parents are happy with you, okay with you, or mad at you. If your parents are ever mad at you, you get grounded. Yes, that actually happens in the game, which takes up two of your cubes, and it's terrible. So you have two less hours a day because you've been grounded. Um, the other way you can move is ride a robot. That gets into a whole other thing that we'll talk about in a moment. So that's all your different ways to move. You can scout an area. In a, your spot or adjacent spot, you can flip over a rumor card to read it, or you can see how hard a robot is to hack, or often the scenarios have ways to scout things. Like I found that came up a lot in the different scenarios where like, scout the robots that are over here, or scout this location three times or something like that. So you can scout, then you can interact with something. That's how you actually try to solve a rumor, or it might be something on the card, like you need to interact with this robot to get it started again because it's out of power. One thing worth testing. noting. One thing worth noting is movement. Uh, it's a big, bigger map than you think it is. Yes. Uh -huh. So getting from point A to point B takes a lot, and then it seems like six hours is a lot, but uh, it takes a long time to get uh, between yeah. places on the map. All right. Another thing you can do is hack robots. This uses a whole mini game where you're pulling tiles out of a bag and making multiple skill checks. Uh, it's probably the most complicated part of the rules and definitely not something I'm going to fully cover here. I will just say it's hard um, to go with the robots. They're either alert or not. And hacking an alert robot, I've got to say, is almost impossible. You only want to hack when they're when they're not alert. Um, there's also rules for if you move into a spot with an alert robot, something might happen. There's a whole thing with these robots moving around the boards. They move at the start of the turns. Uh, we're not going to get into the details of that. Um, when you're interacting with a spot and you're making a check, so one of the things I didn't mention before is often the rewards will be you get items. Plus, every character starts with their signature item. One of the coolest things in this game is all of the items can be combined with other items. Now, they can't all be combined with each other, but if you combine the lighter with the spray paint, you can make an explosive. And the way these work in the game is every time you go to make a skill check, it'll tell you how you can automatically succeed. If you have two items that will combine to the right keyword, you don't have to make a die roll. That is one of the neatest things in the system. So if you combine one of the character's bikes with your AV cable, you can tow something and so on. There's all these different combos. When you hack a robot, they give you a full free thing they can do. So the, the Parhoffer robot lets you tow things around if you've hacked that robot. So that's another neat part of the system. Um, you can rest. That's how you remove those conditions. Again, conditions are things that you get, you get frustrated, you get exhausted, you can even be hurt and injured. That ends up using up your cubes. Also, if you're stressed out, you can't help other people. And there's a whole bunch of system for that going on as well. Uh, the last action you can do is you can go home in time for dinner. So you are expected to make it home in time for dinner. And if you don't, your parents are going to get upset with you. And again, if they're already in with you, they're going to ground you for not being home on time. So part of the game is making sure you're home on time. And of course, with all this going on, remember, you still have chores you're trying to complete as well, which usually require you to go somewhere and spend cubes. All right, you got all that? Like, like that's, that's still an overview. Like the, this is a crunchy game with a lot going on. There, there is tons going on. And that's about all I can tell you. Because then there's all the other stuff that comes up when you read the cards. You might be beating up teenagers. You might need to figure out the secret code to join the UFO club. You, you might end up placing new locations on the map where you can actually go to the video store or go to the astronomy center and talk to the astronomer. Like This is a big chunk of a game that is trying to recreate the feel of the role-playing game and get you immersed into this world of playing kids solving mysteries. The, the card decks involved here are remarkable and the amount of, of sort of A and B sides of cards and this card triggers this card, which triggers this card, which brings out this card and flips this card over to side B. Uh, despite yeah. the fact that this is a board game and it's very, in some ways, I want to say linear. I mean, it's on rails. Yeah. Uh, the fact that they have got such a wide branching system mm -hmm. for these individual scenarios really, again, until you've played it a few times, if you choose to play it multiple times in a scenario, you're not going to see it all. There's going to be yeah. other things that, that will happen and can happen in that scenario that you just don't know about. And there was one scenario that had three ways to lose and two ways to win. 
So even that, even playing the same scenario, you could play it five times and get five different endings. So now that you've got a pretty good idea of how Tales from the Loop plays, let's move on to sharing some of our thoughts about the game. All right, so so first disclosure here. Um, I love Tales from the Loop. I love the setting. I love the role-playing game. I love the art of Simon Stallenhog. I grew up in the 80s. I love that era. I love the Goonies. I love uh, E.T. and I loved Stranger Things. This is definitely my childhood we're playing out with. Sean and I spent more times on our bikes than home with our parents. It was just part of our childhood and getting to play that out is really cool. And that alone makes me want this game. Like as soon as I heard this existed, I needed to have a copy. Absolutely. I, the memories and the thoughts, uh, the only sort of interesting weirdness of it is that unlike the RPG, which has an, a, a North American and a European setting, this one only has the European setting, the original, uh, the the original Northern European setting for the game. So pronunciation of some things becomes a little weird. Uh, but once you're over that, again, there's still a lot of this feel of hopping on your bikes and out running the bullies, or you know whatever you know, returning the video, the VHS tape to the video stores. Mm -hmm. um, I, maybe not the robots, but other than that, there's a whole lot of familiarity. Yes. No, I, I have to agree 100%. No, I got to admit, I, I would have liked a two-sided board. Like, like the role-playing game did such a good job in the starter set, which you can read our review of, did such a good job of just having a slash, like two names for everything, that I, I can't imagine the production cost being that much more to have given me Denver on the other side. Though I have to say, there was no point when playing, except for trying to pronounce some of the locations on the map, that I felt like I was Sweden or I felt foreign or out of place or wrong. Yeah. It definitely didn't really get in the way of being able to play. No, absolutely. Again, it's, it's really just pronunciation because there are a couple of letters or letters with, uh, you know, symbols over top of them that we don't use in, in English. Yes. And you kind of shoot your shot on what it sounds like. And, and don't play it live. Don't play it on a live stream if you don't want to embarrass yourself <laughs> exactly. with uh, pronunciations in front of the public. So yeah, love Tales from Loop, and I like the concept of this. Basically, you can tell there was a group that loved the role-playing game or worked on it. I know the designer names don't overlap there, but I, there's got to be something. They're all from Free League. I'm not sure. Someone definitely involved with the role-playing game worked on this, and this is basically trying to give you a GM-less Tales from the Loop experience for good or bad. That is definitely the driving here. This is very much these same mechanics from the role-playing game ported to a board game. I already mentioned above, you use the same dice. You use the same six skills. Though all that matters in this is two of your skills. You don't have your full set of six, and you don't have all the mechanics from like your, um, I forget what the term is. I've read the role-playing game and I played it, um, where, where you, you have like a touchstone where you talk, talk to someone to get your, your exhaustion goes away by going to your secret place. All that stuff's kind of gone. It's definitely a high-level version. and. This leads to some problems because it's trying so hard to be a role-playing game that it sometimes fails as a board game because of it. Now, yeah. one of the go ahead. No, no, no. Now, one of the biggest ways this happens, and and one one of the biggest problems I have with this game is the dice mechanics. So you are rolling a d6 dice pool, and all that matters are sixes. I don't have the math in front of me. I probably should have grabbed it. But when you're rolling like five or six dice, which is pretty much your standard roll in this game, your odds of success are like 52%. Now, I'll admit, when you push, you're up to like 80%. So the game obviously wants you to push. But even with that 80%, it is so hard to succeed at a skill roll, even when you have all the cards on the table. When you've got a character there trained in the skill, it's, it's one of their favorite skills. They happen to have a keyed item that's of the right type they have two other characters with them helping and you still fail. And in a role-playing game, I have no problem with that because in a role-playing game failure, especially a well-written role-playing game, a failure is interesting. And the Tales from the Loop role-playing game is all about making failure interesting and getting your kids into deeper and deeper trouble is part of the fun. That doesn't work in a board game. In a board game, when you fail, you just fail. You, you wasted your cubes. You didn't get the thing. You now get penalized with Enigma. 
Like it's it's there's none of the reward for failing, but still keeps the honestly terrible odds from the role playing game. And that I find is a major failing in this game as a board game. Now, if you're a role player, you may not mind this, right? Especially if you're used to the dice and fails from the loop and you're really used to knowing, yeah, I never make a test unless I have six dice or whatever. That might not bother you, but for a standard hobby board gamer, I think this is going to be a problem for a lot of people. Absolutely. I think there's there's some some real concern when you take this mechanic from from one to the other. You know, this whole episode, we've been talking about board games and RPGs uh, and, and how they interact. And in many ways, it's great. But in this one particular choice of dice rolling mechanic, mm-hmm. a, a dice pool that requires a single value success. Where there is no failure modifier, like there's no there's no good things or 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 even range of bad things that happens for failure. It's either yeah, there's no success fail. with the complication. Right. It's pass or fail. And the odds of passing are terrifyingly low yeah. from a board game player's perspective. Yes. Now that said, I don't want to totally ruin the game here and say it's terrible because of that, because otherwise there's some really cool stuff going on here. You honestly get that I'm playing a kid feel. You get the parents don't listen to me. I have to do it all myself, except for the car ride thing, I guess, Um, which does lead to another weird rule where you can't give other kids rides. That's another thing I personally hate. I I think there should be a rule that you if you're with another kid and they get a ride, you can get a ride with them. But anyway, um, I love the, the, the again, the physicality of the game. The game looks fantastic, feels fantastic. Don mentioned how innovative and interesting the card mechanic system for for keeping you working works. The world is interesting. They even give you a source book on the world, which I you don't get in most board games, unless they're historical where they present whatever battles happening. You don't tend to get a background book. So that's really cool. Um, but the RPG like moments of this game are amazing and, and make up for me all the problems. When I'm sitting there and we're debating what to do in our turn, and it's like halfway through a day and everyone's used up a few cubes and you're like, all right, look, if we just move over here, and I scout the machine, then we get to see it, what, it's, what its hacking ability is, then the rest of you move up, we'll attempt the hack, but first we gotta get past the watchdogs. Now to get past the watchdogs, you're the fastest, so you should ride up there on your bike first, because you'll get to make the roll, and then you can help us get past the watchdogs. And then the character of the bike's like, dude, I can't, I have to go to hockey practice. If I lead you guys up there past the watchdogs, there's no way I can make it to hockey practice. And you have an actual in-game argument going, look, it's Thursday. You have tomorrow. You can go to hockey practice tomorrow. And you convince the other player to go to do it. And then they go. Well, you get to the fence and he leads the guard dogs away. But then one of the other characters has to make a strength test to make it over. And another player decides to help. And they boost them over the fence, but they fail. And they get hurt. The other player that helped ends up being scared because they saw another kid get hurt. And that all happens mechanically in a board game. And then there's a later role where you're going to ro- do the robot and the player's like, hey, can you help me with this? Or like, hell no, I'm not touching anything like that. Remember when you hopped over the fence and you got all cut up? I'm not helping you. Like these were actual conversations and things that happened in a board game, not a role-playing game. Absolutely. And you know what? It's, again, there's there's this depth of of play that's there in the game uh and in some ways that's helped by the fact that you're failing all the time yeah. unfortunately you still want to have the chance to win <laughs> yes uh and and one of the interesting things that this uh that this sort of thing has done is they have taken away a lot of the quarterbacking so there okay. is no turn order there is no, no me you, you know, everyone can go anytime if one person wants to take all their hours and be done and then it's everyone else's turn that's a totally legitimate strategy uh but because of everyone's little you know chores and things uh and, and their their plans to you know when they want to finish their chore or when they have mm-hmm. to finish their chore there's there's a little sort of wedge in there that stops you from being able to effectively quarterback even if you wanted to so if you right. went, went into the game planning on quarterbacking to a win you would have a very very hard time yeah. achieving that uh without playing it solo essentially 
No, I totally agree with that. So we're talking about how bad the die rolls are, right? So, so like the concept's awesome. The mechanics work. The mechanics for making, again, except for the dice roll odds, but like the spending hours to do things. I, I particularly love the, the parent happiness mechanics actually just work really well. Um, one of the results, if the watchdogs catch you, is you get bagged and tag, and that upsets your parents, which is really easy to get grounded for getting bagged and tag. But when you get bagged and tag, you can keep still doing what you were doing. It's just now your name's on record. Like there's some really awesome stuff there. The problem is the next problem is playing with high player counts. Now, the first four games we played of this, we played with four or five players. And honestly, we thought the game was impossible. Not only is there the dice roll problem, there is a whole system with the rumors. Now, you have four rumors out. You probably want to try to solve all the rumors if possible, but at least some of them, just to get your enigma or your insight, like to prevent the enigma and get insight. And possibly that's also your way to get items and things. And also really cool tech called anomalies. That's another thing I didn't get into before, but you want anomalies. Trust me, they're good. Anomalies are a good thing in this game. Um, but to do that, you got to do the rumors. Then at the start of every turn in the school phase, at the top of that school card that tells you what happens, it tells you how many rumors to put out. Now, most cards say player count. It uses icons for this. Some cards say player count minus one. And in the basic deck, two cards say player count minus two. Now, this has a minimum of one. So no matter how many players you're playing with, you're always going to get one rumor and a max of four. Now, this sounds like it all works, but when you are at five players, almost every time you are going to draw all but two cards in an entire deck, you are going to draw four new rumors, which means if you haven't solved every rumor, every round, you're going to get penalized with Enigma, which is generally two Enigma. And in one scenario, it's three Enigma for just for them getting pushed off the board. With five players, we found the game to be impossible. You just couldn't do all the rumors let alone still try to solve the mystery. Like, like the rumors aren't the main part most of the time. You're usually trying to do other things. And this goes back to what I was mentioning earlier about travel. So mm -hmm. again, you've got six cubes to move around the board. And that seems like a lot, six hours. I got tons of time and I can take the bus all the way up here. But the rumors get randomly distributed across the board. Mm -hmm. And if you're all starting at the school, it takes without, without using anything extraneous if you just want to get to the furthest location on the board it takes five hours yeah, five cubes so you have one cube to do something with and if you've got rumors out there or if you've got more than one rumor on that path to get there it can't be done yeah. <laughs> i mean it, it it's just you run into these literal uh roadblocks with the rumor system and mm. and to me I was thinking about this earlier, and it's something that we never really talked about, I think, but because the the two game stats, the timers, uh, the good and the bad, are separate stats, it becomes a real problem, right? So as you as your your negative stat goes up, it hit it, when, once it hits a certain point, the game's essentially over. Uh, and what I think might have been a better strategy or a better game mechanic, is if it was a tug of Scale. war, if, if, if it was a plus minus. So you started off at zero and as you passed your rumors, you got plus. And if you failed some rumors or, you know, the rumors got pushed off, they went to zero and you had, they, they felt like you had a chance to mm -hmm. get to a level you needed. Cause this, at, at this point, it just feels with these high player counts. I want to specify that yeah. with the high player counts, it just feels like, you're starting at the bottom of a hill and the avalanche already started. See, I'm not sure. It, it depends on the scenario. So, so unfortunately, Sean only got a chance to play in one scenario that we did try a couple times. Um, no, you tried no, two we different did two. We did two different, yeah, two different scenarios. So I have played in scenarios that use both dials very effectively where your enigma goes up a bit. Things start getting interesting. So you haven't lost the game, just things escalate. Meanwhile, you're still getting the insight to solve problems. And that wouldn't work. Like, you couldn't have that. And I actually really enjoyed, again, there are a couple scenarios I recommend playing first. I really enjoyed the fact that, like, some enigma is kind of inevitable, especially with the dice pool system. 
but having it not be too punishing, which is what we saw in The Passenger and what we saw in The Late Fantastic, Late Fantastic specifically, stuff started to happen when the Enigma went up, but it wasn't you lose. Whereas the one scenario you played, like the, the one with the film crew, definitely would be better as a sliding sail, I think. Right. That one in particular, bottom muck, I don't even know. Like, like bottom muck, were you in the game where we got to like 48? No, Enigma? that was that was the first time. Okay, so that was the first time I played. Like the Enigma dial stops at 15 or something, and we had 48 by the end of the game, which was interesting because it didn't matter. Like that wasn't a lose condition. So we were just like, let's let everything happen until we flip the card. And it was a lose condition. Right. And that's one of the ways we lost. But we did find out we could have won. So what I will say is we played multiple times and could not win at four or five players. And I haven't done it. I should have done it before the review. But I, I am certain that at five players in certain scenarios, if you passed every die roll and did everything right, you still couldn't win. Be well, you could. But only if you drew the minus twos and minus ones on all the time on the rumors or all your rumors are on the main island. Like, like it, it, it's honestly broken. Like yeah, without, I hate without, calling a board game broken, but without playing it through, we, we, we did some sort of mind gaming of it and tried to imagine, okay, what had, what would have happened last night? What if, if we, we had passed every, every single role and it still didn't feel like we had had a chance. Yeah. And, and, and we know, and we say this regularly on this show, if you're playing a co-op game, you shouldn't win the majority of the time. It no. should be hard. It should always it be should close. Be a struggle, you, but it should be close. The impossibility is what breaks the game. And that's one yeah. of the things that my kids have really had a hard time with about some of the, uh, some of the, some of the, uh, the co-op games that we've played with Hogwarts, where they have just felt from like, you know, right up start, you know, the way that the way it all dealt out, the way the starting condition became it, it was downhill from from then. And and that's really what these high player count versions of this game in the scenarios that I've played were feeling like. I honestly have a player who refuses to ever play the game again, like not even give it a try, even after I've tried to redeem the game, which does happen as long as you play with three or less players. This game works perfectly, smoothly, at less than four players. Now, I know as Board Game Geek still somehow says four, three to four players as being the sweet spot, and I still wonder if that four is there from the prototype version of the game. So let's get into that for a second before I get into three-player play. One of the issues I have with this game is it does not have the best written rule book. It is a rule book written by role players who are definitely not board gamers, and they like to hide rules all over the place. Now, there is multiple page threads on Board Game Geek with rule questions. And interestingly, every single one, the designer was able to point to the rule in the rule book. Now, the problem is the designer had to point to those rules in the rule book, and there are multiple pages where they've had to do this. So I honestly don't can't say it's a good rule book, but I will say everything's in there somewhere. It's just not necessarily where you'd expect it to be, or it may not be clear how it's written. But I do strongly recommend you go on Board Game Geek and read those threads. The other problem, though, is this game was originally released. Um, I, I don't know what order these came in. So there was a print and play version released as part of the Kickstarter. There was also a Tabletopia or Tabletop Simulator, I forget which, version of the game released. Those two have different rules. Even more so, the retail finally final version of the game is very different from both of those. And when looking for rule questions, you will often find videos and FAQs for the older versions. And if you go on the board game geek thread, you'll eventually find a point where it says anything from this point on is the old game. And this is the new game, but sorry, I don't have that number in front of me, but like I watched, watch it played videos that didn't match what I read at all. Some examples are the player boards look completely different where each action spot had a set number of cubes that would fit in it. That's something that's been completely eliminated. Another is you used to have to spend a time cube to help that's been eliminated. So if you're reading or watching anything that has those two things, you're watching old information. And and we should say that not only is this, you know, a, a, a an interesting game, no one has said this is an easy game. This is rated, this has got a weight of 3.3. 3. Yep. This is listed as a heavy, uh, medium heavy, heavy game. Uh, this is not something, this is not family weight, even even at the lower player count where it's, it's uh, you know, it, it is a, an achievable game. It's not a family weight game. This no. is a thinker. Yeah. 
the, this and it's fiddly. There are lots of tokens. And like Sean said, you've got cards and you draw new cards and you flip some of the cards and some cards get discarded. Then you put new cards into play. Like that's all part of it. There's the cubes you're moving around. There's the the number of different actions you have, especially once some of those cards start ending new actions. You're tracking two different stats. There's all the items you can combine. There's just a lot going on. Now, getting back to three-player count, three-player count, the game honestly works. Like the first time we sat down and won a game was on April 1st, and I purposely didn't want to say, hey, we won. But like we were so happy because we hacked a robot rode that robot and won an encounter all in one game and that felt so awesome and i we have never hacked a robot at four or five players it just never happened there was always something that stopped us or it was just too many checks to make to be able to do it being able to actually do that was so much fun the hacking system when you hack a non-alert robot with only three players is actually enjoyable and seems very doable and yes we had to push twice and we had to use items to do it but sure that's fine we were able to succeed. And that ability to ride a robot actually was neat and cool and fun where a robot took us over the water to be able to get to this area we needed to get to. And that was neat to see. So I'm sorry to say this is a three player game max, in my opinion, without house rules. And now maybe that house rule is you always do whatever the card is for rumors minus one. So that there's a way better chance because that was the thing with three players. We would solve four rumors, and sometimes only one new rumor would come out. You got three blank spots. You can basically let everything go because even if you get player count, which gives you an entire day where you don't have to worry about trying to solve the rumors, you can focus on the story. That's the turn where we all gathered together and hacked a robot because we didn't have to worry about the rumors. And honestly, with three players, it's your choice if one of the rumors gets bumped. Because you're always going to be able to do it. You're going to be able to do enough rumors that you don't lose points for ignoring them, which that just feels better. It's, it's more enjoyable. It fits the theme better. Like, like just ignoring things and losing because you couldn't possibly do them is disappointing. Whereas when it's your choice, you're like, look, we're going to gain some enigma. But right now we're almost there. We've almost got access to the UFO club. We're going to get the secret password. We're good to go. You know what? This turn? Let's just focus on that and ignore that and know we're going to get the enigma. Then it becomes a player choice and not a punishment. There's also some interesting stuff, and this doesn't really come up much. And I think it's something that you've overlooked um, just as kind of part of what's going to happen. But the items in the game can at times sort of take you out of things. Uh, there are things like um, one of the items is makeup, which yep. gives you a boost in charm and can help you hack a robot <laughs> you well, know no nothing can help you hack a robot that is not something included in the retail version of the game items have help you hack nope. a robot. yeah oh nope. not at all none of the robots have any keywords for hacking it's something that must have been removed in the retail version but why they're they're all colored for oh well, yeah you can use them that way yes yeah, yeah. or you can use them that way. yeah no uh, but that makes sense with a watchdog because it's trying to identify you and bag and tag you and you put on makeup to disguise yourself as someone else. Fair Come on, it's based on a role-playing game. Uh, but there, there are things like Sorry, that. There, there, that is something I did want to bring up. There, there, supposedly the rule book mentions that there are combos you can use to hack a robot. There are not. And I don't know if that was something in an earlier yeah, no, version. Or something just the just the this skill was board. just using the AI. I thought you were talking about. No, no, no. Stat you bonus. were using makeup with a thing to hack no, a no, robot. Stat, no, stat bonus for charm. Stat bonuses. Okay, yeah, that's different. Sorry, that was me misunderstanding. Um, yeah, no, there's there's there, there's certainly some thematic things that 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 could could leave people cold. Uh, one of the things is this game feels like the robots should be a massive part all the time. Yes, and they aren't. And by <laughs> putting giant miniatures out of them, yeah, it just kind of makes you think they should matter. Yes, and, and 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 it is very scenario dependent. It's very scenario dependent. They're always there, but a lot of the times they're completely ignorable. Yeah. Um, whereas there are certain scenarios where if you don't go in and hack them, there's just no possible way. Yes. Uh, and that's, that feels odd, uh, because they really do feel like a major component. They've got these mm -hmm. big cards at the top and these giant miniatures and they, they take up sp a lot of space on the board yep. and, and it really feels like you need to focus on them, but it, because the game has put so much effort into them, but you don't. 
Yeah, not necessarily. On a, a, the robots have come up in most of the ones I played. Like obviously, bottom muck is called bottom muck. Um, so, so one, so a couple things about this uh, before we get to some very final thoughts is this feels like a board game of a role playing game. This does not feel like your standard Euro game, your standard, you know, Steffenfeld resource management or anything like that. This is definitely trying to be a role-playing game and get elements of that role-playing game in there. And I think it succeeds at that. The problem is it brings in the trappings of role-playing games, like the dice pool system, which I really don't think works in this. And then I don't honestly know what happened with the player count. Like, like I'm wondering if it's something that happened from those iterations from print and play to, again, they might be in the other order, digital to print and play whenever they came out where print and play to digital to final game. I think something broke in there. And I don't know if it was people complaining that things aren't easy, difficult enough or not. But like in the back of the rule book, though, there is a section on how to make the game easier and harder. Take that to heart and make the game easier when you first start playing. Like take every hack you can. Like there's some really simple ones that just make sense. Like characters who are helping can contribute their items to the main role. Why not? If I'm there with you, why can't I hand you my cable or my hair or take my bike? Like it just fits. Things like that. Um, there's other ones back there. I can't remember exactly what they are. You probably won't need the ones to make it more difficult. The other thing you might want to house rule is many of the scenarios will require numbers of things, set numbers of uh, insight that are higher for higher player counts. Just don't make that adjustment. Just use whatever the lowest is. Because like we played a scenario where it's like you need nine to win with three players, but you need 18 to win with five. And the way the game works, having two more players does not double your ability to solve rumors, especially when only the rumor cards with the right symbols on them count. Like there's something that broke there when, when adjusting the player count. Like maybe it was only a four player game originally and they decided to squeeze in a fifth player and it, something fell apart there. The other thing, and I've mentioned it before, do not play bottom muck as your first scenario. You might not ever want to play bottom muck. For one, it's one of the only two week scenarios and this game gets long when you play two weeks very long like more than three hours long with two weeks stick to the one week scenarios and i strongly recommend you start with the light fantastic the reason i suggest that is it removes a chunk of the mechanics from the game so you don't have to worry about them and i don't want to spoil what but you want to start with that one if you want to experience everything in the game like if you want to taste for everything for your first game then do the passenger so I recommend the Light Fantastic, and then once you beat Light Fantastic, play the Passenger. From there, do whatever you want. Uh, the Plant one was particularly fun, I will say. Um, there, there are some other ones. Bottom Muck, I, 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 we had such a bad experience with that, trying to learn with it. I have no interest in ever playing Bottom Muck. There are other scenarios. There's a good number of them in there. The, the tape one is actually would be fun with three players. The the where you your characters have found a videotape and you're just gonna go around and film all the weird things happening because of the loop. Again, the scenarios are fantastic. The theme is fantastic, but there are some problems with this game. Yeah, no, I have to say, you know, after my experience playing five player, two different scenarios, if if I didn't know that that Mo had played it at three and 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 found a vastly different experience yeah. i would walk away from this game and never consider mm -hmm. playing it again uh it's only because i trust that you know when he says no no it really is a better game at three yeah. uh, that i can trust that opinion that i would ever sit down again and try it at three players to get that experience and get the bad taste out of my mouth which is yeah. what the five player experience really left yeah and sean's not the only one like i said i have a friend who, who who refuses to play and I have another one that I convinced to give another try gave it another try I was like okay I can see it I can see how this could be fun but I'm still not interested in playing it again I'd rather play other games that are on your shelf so very much so this game is not for everyone this is not in any way a game your random euro I like hobby board games fan should just go out and pick up this is a game for fans of tales from the loop who also happen to like fiddly, heavy, not unforgiving board games. But like, if you're a Catan player, or you love Uwe Rosenberg, or you like Food Chain Magnet, I'm just trying to pick a big range of hobby games. And you're like, oh, Tales from the Loop. I know nothing about that. That looks interesting. This is probably not the game for you. This is to me a game for fans. 
Fair enough. Now, role-playing game players, I will say, may be more forgiving because you've got your character sheets, you've got a, a resolution mechanic system that will seem familiar to many role players. You've even even the whole system of taking injuries and something bad something bad happened to push your dice is going to be familiar. So role-playing game players who are interested in board games that feel kind of like role-playing games may want to check this out, uh, especially if you're a Tales from Loop role-playing game fan, right? Tales from Loop Loop role-playing game fans probably already bought this at this point. Um, You might might enjoy it, right? If you're a D&D player or whatever, you, you may get more out of this than your average board game player would because of those RPG elements. Overall, should you buy this or not, it's going to be up to you. Um, if you're a Tales from the fan and completionist, why not? You're going to get some cool minis. You get some cool cards. You have a game that you may have some fun with. Other than that, this is probably a pass. Definitely a try before you buy. I almost think for every gamer, if there's a way for you to try it before you buy, do it. But again, remember that version on digital is not the version you'd be buying. And I have no idea if they have any plans to update that to match this retailer. All right, well, that's it for our review of Tales from the Loop, the board game. If you've tried this one out with your group, we would love to know if you had similar experiences, Mm -hmm. which you can tell us about in the comments down below. I also invite you to check out the written review over at tabletopbellhop.com, where I'm going to get into more detail, especially in regards to how to play the game, the actions, and maybe hacking. I can definitely put a lot more on the blog than I want to talk about in a podcast segment. So... Check that out for even more info on Tales from the Loop, the board game.